Hello and welcome to Indiana Wildlife Federation's presentation of Indiana's Wild Climate, where we're going to talk a little bit about climate change and what that means for us here in Indiana. My name is Aaron Stump. I'm the Indiana Wildlife Federation's Habitat Programs Manager. Uh, and if you're not familiar with our organization, I'll just do a brief introduction to who we are. So we were founded in 1938 by uh, a numerous conservation clubs who recognized the need uh, to conserve uh, the wildlife and the wildlife habitat that was rapidly dwindling here in Indiana. Um, we have since become the uh, state affiliate, the Indiana state affiliate of the National Wildlife Federation. And uh, we promote our methods of conservation through three key uh, activities, uh, education, advocacy, and action. Uh, advocacy is when we go uh, talk about certain legislation uh, on Capitol Hill, when we go testify in front of the legislature. Uh, action is when we do our events. We do monarch taggings, we do native plantings, we do invasive removals, things like that. And then education is what we're doing here today, where we try to um, make what is often pretty complicated uh, material uh, something that everybody can understand and hopefully get something out of. So I'm going to start off this presentation with a little analogy that I like, um, because I don't know where anybody's climate science knowledge begins, so I'm going to start at square one. And we're going to talk about the first big hurdle of understanding climate science, which is figuring out the difference between weather and climate. Now, we have a few things here that you can read through, uh, the basic differences between weather and climate, but I like to boil it down to a pretty simple analogy. Um, weather is your mood, and climate is your personality. So your mood can change every day. It can change multiple times throughout the day. But your personality is more of who you are, right? It's informed by the aggregate of those weather events and their average over a long period of time. And while it can change, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of time uh, for those changes to take place. So now we're going to go back in time and look at the origins of climate science so that we can begin to understand where it all came from and how we got to where we are today. And I'm going to start off with this picture. Uh, I always tell people I don't care if you like what you see here, if you don't like what you see here, if it inspires you to feel uh, good or bad feelings, whatever. It usually inspires people to feel something. Uh, I think, and it's probably because a large part of my age, Al Gore was very uh, impactful on climate science and the discussion around climate science. Uh, he was by no means the beginning, uh, but he was a catalyst for a, a change in the discussion where it went from being a discussion over the science and what we what should we do about it to becoming a little bit more politicized and I think that's why I think the era around 2006 when an inconvenient truth was released and a little bit before that um, talking about climate change was not something that was polarizing it was not something that made us feel uncomfortable and I still don't think it should be and I'm hoping that by going through this little brief history we can we can all agree that this is not something political we're talking about this is not something controversial this is just something serious that we really need to focus on and figure out what to do. So there are a lot of different places where you could say the history of climate science began. Uh, all the way back in 1824, Joseph Fourier was talking about uh, radiation and how radiation from the sun was causing our planet to be a certain temperature. Uh, decades later, John Tyndall expanded on that. In 1859, he published about radiation and gases in the atmosphere and how he thought that might have some effect on the temperature of our planet. But I like to begin when things really became uh, relevant to today with a guy named Savante Arrhenius, who in 1896 hypothesized that some of John Tyndall's work on, on gases uh, were responsible for our Earth's uh, temperature because they were capturing heat. And he is basically where the term greenhouse gases was, was sort of born. Now, back in the 1800s, this was the Industrial Revolution. They were burning coal like crazy. And his hypothesis at the time that was that if they didn't stop burning coal the way they were, if they continued with it, that our planet could see a global increase in temperature average of about five to six degrees uh, Celsius. And he really wasn't that far off. Um, the Paris Accords we had recently were talking about trying to keep us below that two degrees C mark, but scientists have almost universally agreed that if we stopped emitting greenhouse gases today, we would not meet that two degrees C mark. Most models are between four and eight degrees C right now. So Savante Arrhenius has really been, um, 
he was almost prophetic in his ability to uh, predict this, but he was using science and science hasn't really changed. Uh, he was using uh, some, some pretty, uh, some pretty well-founded science to make his predictions. And that's why he was so accurate. Several decades later, a guy came along named Charles David Keeling and Al Gore sort of uh, popularized what's called the Keeling curve, which was his analysis of uh, carbon dioxide emissions at the Mauna Loa Observatory, uh, where for decades he monitored uh, the parts per million, and we'll talk about this in a, in a little bit, the parts per million CO2 levels in our atmosphere. Uh, Al Gore called it the hockey stick graph. It was that sort of sharp upward curve. Well, that's known as the Keeling curve. And we're gonna see that uh, in a video here in just a minute. In 1981, a scientist named James Hansen published a study where he made some predictions that have been uh, startlingly true. But again, he was using well-founded science. He wasn't just conjuring these things out of the air. So that's how he was able to figure this out. He said, and I quote, uh, potential effects on the climate in the 21st century include the creation of drought prone regions in North America, a shifting of climatic zones, erosion of the West Antarctic ice sheet with consequent worldwide rise in sea level, and the opening of the fabled Northwest Passage. So he was right on all counts, right? We have seen the creation of drought prone zones uh, across North America. We now have water use uh, laws in place out West because there is so much drought and so little water. And Indiana, even though we have long been considered a wet state, we're not immune from that. We are working towards that uh, water, water, not just water quality problems, we're now working towards water quantity problems. Uh, he said there would be a shifting in climatic zones. He was absolutely right. If, you've, if you're a plant person at all, I know most of you are, you know that the USDA hardiness zones have shifted within my lifetime. Uh, he talked about the erosion of the ice sheets. He, we have seen uh, polar lows that are historic. They're historic lows. Uh, we've also seen a worldwide rise in sea levels. And the last part of this slide, we'll talk about the effects of that. And finally, he predicted the opening of the fabled Northwest Passage. Now, if you're not familiar with that, it's a, a passage around the Arctic Circle. It was considered to be the most valuable trade route in the world. There were explorers who lost their lives trying to find passageways through there. And in 2007, the Northwest Passage became open for the first time without the need of a special ship to break through the ice. Uh, I believe that today you can actually book uh, luxury cruises that will take you through the Northwest Passage. Um, so he was tragically right on that account. And then he also predicted a worldwide rise in sea levels. And in 2019, the Bramble K. Malomus was declared extinct. Now this is a small rodent that lived on Great Barrier Reef Islands. Um, it is not, I can guarantee you, the first animal that has gone extinct directly due to climate change, but it is the first one whose extinction has been attributed to climate change because these barrier reef islands, because of sea level rise, have been completely inundated for the entire year and their habitat was destroyed and they were, they were, uh, um, they only lived on those islands and so uh, they were unfortunately lost. Now, before I start this video, I just want to break down, and I hope you can see my cursor. I just want to break down a little bit what we're looking at because this is a lot of information in one really cool video that I absolutely love, and they update this uh, every couple of years with new data. So over here on the left, you see the blue and the red dot. Those indicate monitoring stations. The blue dot is the South Pole. The red dot is uh, the Mauna Loa Observatory, which uh, David Keeling um, was at, um, and it shows you where these monitoring stations are, these little dots based on the, uh, um, the latitude of our, our globe. And then the number on the far left is the CO2 parts per million. So how much of our atmosphere is made up of uh, carbon dioxide. And then over here on the right, we see what year the data is from, what time of uh, that year, what month of that year uh, the data is from. And then we will slowly map out uh, a plot of what that data looks like. And then after that's done, we're gonna go back in time and compare it to historic data. So let's just get this started. And we'll have a look at what happens. You can see why they call it the pump handle video. Uh, the Mauna Loa Observatory and all those uh, more northern observatories are fluctuating up and down uh, very rapidly as the years uh, go by. So the overall rise is a year by year change and then the pumping of the handle is the fluctuations that occur between winter and summer essentially. So in 1989 Mauna Loa saw 350 parts per million for the last time and this was considered pretty monumental at the time. This was something that alarmed people when we broke this uh, 350 parts per million barrier but as you can see by 
the plot, we're moving way past that now. We're also getting a lot more data points, which means that this information is becoming more robust. Um, it's becoming more reliable. And as we move a little bit farther on, we get into early 2000s, you can see we're now approaching 380 parts per million. This is pretty extreme. And this is uh, over here on the left, this graph that's forming is showing you sort of that hockey stick graph that uh, Al Gore liked to, to point out, but we've gone even past his data now. And now you can see we've finally reached over 400 parts per million. And in January 2017, we hit 406. Um, I believe last year we were at 415. So we've even blown away that, that number. And then the green is Keeling's data. And then we go farther back in time. Now these data points were obtained using ice cores. So scientists can drill down into the ice, they can pull out the frozen water and that water captures the gases that were in the atmosphere at the time. And it allows them to understand the makeup of the atmosphere when that ice sample is dated. Now we're going back into some even older ice cores, the Vostok ice cores, and these get back tens of thousands of years. We're gonna go back hundreds of thousands of years here. We're starting to see uh, ice ages. We are seeing well before humans were having any impact uh, on the climate. And once we get back to about 800,000 years ago, that's where our data comes to a close. If you compare these blue peaks and valleys to what we're seeing now, we're seeing this 400 and now 415 parts per million spike. These blue peaks and valleys that we're seeing, these are the natural normal cycles that our planet goes through. These are what we would expect if we were plotting out uh, climate change based on um, how our planet behaves without us. And the data that we have now is demonstrating that we are way outside of, uh, of that normal. So this is, a great, um, this is a great slide that was presented to us by uh, uh, the Purdue Climate Change Research Center. Uh, Jeff Dukes gave us a presentation and he used this slide and it really had an impact on me. So I just stole it from him. I think this is a, it's a great visualization of what, I, I don't know why we as humans, uh, we struggle with seeing data. We like to think about how it's going to feel and so uh, they, they laid this out and it's, it's quite striking. So this is gonna show us what to expect Indiana to feel like in our summer and winter uh, based on two different climate models. So Purdue modeled out what they called moderate and high emission scenarios. The moderate emission scenario is what happens if we rein ourselves in, we stop emitting so much CO2 into the atmosphere, um, we get things under control. And the high emission scenario is if we, if it's business as usual, if we just keep doing what we're doing now, that's what we can expect. So what this graph shows you is on the left, you'll see how the outline of Indiana has moved and has shifted down sort of into the Tennessee, uh, Western Tennessee area over here. And in the high emission scenario, we're starting to dip all the way down into Texas and Louisiana a little bit. So this is essentially what our summers would feel like, what we would expect the weather to be like uh, in the summer in Indiana if we don't uh, make a change. If you've ever been in the American South in the summer, you know what it feels like. So this kind of gives you an idea. And then in the winter, we start to shift dramatically to the East Coast. Uh, if you've ever been to the East Coast in the winter, they have a lot of rain, uh, followed by uh, some uh, ice storm events and then back to rain. Uh, they have sort of cold flashes, uh, a lot more precipitation than we get. We have a little bit more drier, uh, snowier winters than they do. And then we go into one more climate model. This one models up to 2080. And what this one essentially tells us, you see where the, the 2050 and 2080 models overlap under moderate emission scenario. So if we get things under control, we can mitigate the amount of shift that we experience. This is, this is a hopeful thing. This is where if we do the right thing, we actually can slow this climate change process down. But if we don't, can you imagine Indiana feeling like, I don't know, Corpus Christi, in summer, that would, be, that would be hard to process. And you can imagine what that would do to our plants and to our wildlife that are nowhere near um, Texas climate. Uh, with the winters, it doesn't change too much. It would essentially just get a little bit warmer, uh, a little bit rainier, a little bit less snow. Uh, we'll get into this in a little bit more detail real quick. Um, hey, can I ask any... you a quick question? Yeah, Aaron? yeah, I was gonna ask if anyone asked Oh, questions. it's Brooke here. Um, I turned off my camera. Um, 
so with those winters, is the precipitation level staying similar, but just more rain and less snow, or is that fluctuating in winters as well? Or is there going to be more flooding? It actually is. It, it, it is changing significantly. I'm going to get into that in just a, a couple more slides. Okay. Hopefully I'll answer your question, but if not, yep. let yep. me know. Thank you. Um, so the first thing to, I want to uh, talk about real quick is heat, and I'm just going to focus on Marion County just for the sake of uh, convenience. This displays, this graph down here on the bottom right shows us historically we've had about four days a year over 95 degrees Fahrenheit. In the 2020s, we are looking at um, probably a couple weeks a year over 95 degrees Fahrenheit. That's, that's a very significant change. Uh, but by 2050, when I would like to be an old man spending this time wandering through the woods, we're looking at three to four weeks a year above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And as I, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, that is dangerous to public health. This is not just about um, wildlife. Uh, it's important to have a little bit of focus on people as well. And three or four weeks a year above 95 degrees Fahrenheit is fatal to a lot of people. You can imagine what it does to uh, people who don't have air conditioning, people who can't afford air conditioning, homeless populations, elderly populations. This is very, very dangerous. We also have to talk about frost days. If you're plant people, you know why this is important ahead of time. Uh, we have about 113 days a year below freezing uh, in Indiana, below 32. Um, and that starts to, to drop off as we get warmer and wetter uh, winters. If you know about germination rates and plants, you already know why this is important. If you know about uh, frosts and pest control measures, you know why this is important. Uh, we'll get into that in just a little bit. And then plant hardiness zones, like I said, this has already changed in my lifetime. Um, we're looking at more dramatic shifts. Uh, for instance, up north, uh, our northern latitudes are gonna experience this more than our southern latitudes. Um, but both of them are going to experience plant zone changes. And the significant, the significant takeaway from this is that what we consider to be native plants now may not necessarily be native plants in the future. So it's, it's kind of challenging our concept of what native plants actually mean. Um, a river birch, for instance, is not necessarily something we think of as being native to India. It can be in Indiana, but it's a southern species. But now we're starting to think about um, maybe southern species are the ones that we need to start considering planting. Uh, we have this new concept of planting for resiliency, trying to plant something that will survive the climate change rather than planting a tree that's going to live for 100 years but is going to die in 30 because the climate no longer suits it. And uh, Purdue actually has a really good list of what they call resilient trees. So if you're thinking about planting trees, um, th that's a good way to draw from what they would suggest is going to be something resilient that's going to survive uh, changes. So this is Kind of touch it. I'm going to start touching on that. Your question, Brooke, about uh, precipitation and uh, what that actually means. So we have about 22 percent of our winter precipitation, November through March, that falls as snow. Um, as we experience warmer winters, it goes without saying that percentage drops. We're going to start seeing. They predict by the 2020s, 15 percent will be snow. Half of our historical amount by the 2050s will be. Uh, snow that used to be. So we're going to experience a lot more rain and a lot less snow. And this graph is not particularly pretty to look at, but it actually says a lot. So you can see that as the years go by, these graphs start to become more and more pronounced U-shapes. And what that means is there's going to be a lot less rain in the summer. You can see where this, uh, this, these bars are starting to dip down, a lot less rain uh, in the summer and a lot more rain at the ends of these graphs in the uh, winter months. So we're overall expecting, and this is, this is kind of a challenging concept, we're expecting more rainfall, on average about six to 8% more rain than we usually have. Um, 16 to 20% of that is gonna be increased in the winter and then there's gonna be a significant increase in the spring as well. It's hard to uh, kind of get over this notion that uh, climate change is an increase in temperature, so it's an increase in drought, which should mean less water, but it doesn't actually mean less water. What climate change and hotter temperatures mean is that our hydrologic cycle is just accelerated. So that rain that falls stays on the ground for less time before it's evaporated back into the atmosphere where it rains back down again. So we actually get more water being cycled through our system, 
but it stays on the ground for a less amount of time, which means it doesn't percolate down into our soil. Uh, rainfall causes a lot of erosion issues. Um, and the, like I said, I like to use analogies. So the analogy I use is if you've, you know, we were just, we just went through spring and I'm sure some of you planted some new flowers and you probably used a soaker hose to water your new flowers. So you put down a hose that's perforated and it, it dribbles out a certain amount of water over half an hour, 45 minutes, however long it needs to go. Um, because you know that that deep watering is what the plants really want. Deep water encourages deep roots. So what if you took the same volume of water that you apply over that half an hour and you use a power washer to apply it to your soil in 30 seconds? There's a real big difference. It's not just about the, the volume of water, it's about how it's applied. If you apply it fast and with more intensity, you wash away that soil, you create erosion, it doesn't go down into the soil, it runs off, your plants don't get that deep watering that they need. And so even though it's more water, it amounts to less water in our environment. And that's kind of exemplified by this graph, which shows the increase in precipitation since uh, 1895. We have actually had a significant number of precipitation in inches uh, since the turn of the last century. You've probably seen, and we'll talk about this a little bit, all the flooding that Indiana has gone through. We've had a lot of water come into this state, but it's not staying here. It's running off into our rivers and, and waterways, and it's it's being evacuated from our state where it is again being drawn back up to the atmosphere and raining again. Uh, it's just being accelerated. We're not actually losing water. I hope that answers your question, Brooke. Yes, so, thank you. <laughs> good. I, I, I wouldn't be uh, doing the Indiana Wildlife Federation any service if I didn't talk about the effects on wildlife, right? So first I want to talk about what hotter summers mean for our wildlife. Um, we already have a limited amount of water resources for our wildlife. Uh, when we start accelerating that water cycle, we start evaporating water faster. Those ephemeral pools that like this, this deer pond that uh, these deer have, have been utilizing, they come and they go a lot faster and they, they end up a lot smaller uh, because they're evaporating so quickly. And so the deer have to crowd around uh, and the deer aren't the only ones obviously who do this, but these deer have to crowd around this watering hole in order to utilize this water resource. And we have some very serious deer diseases in this country, everything from tuberculosis to chronic wasting disease. Um, and that is transmitted when they're in close proximity where they normally wouldn't be. So we're forcing them around smaller shrinking water sources um, and that exacerbates things like the disease spread uh, as well. There was a really interesting study done on robin migration and climate change. They wanted to know what effect uh, the temperatures were having on robin migration, and they found that over the course of this 30-year study, uh, when the study ended, they found the robins were on average migrating about 14 days earlier than when the study began. And so you can imagine if these birds are leaving to go to warmer climates uh, where the environment isn't ready for them yet, they don't have a food web established for them to feed off of, uh, they're going to struggle. They're going to have uh, a difficult time. Uh, plants have a very similar system to our sweating. It's called evapotranspiration, where plants take up water from the soil. They, uh, they, they emit it out onto their leaves, and as the water evaporates from their leaves, it takes heat with it, and it cools off the plant. But if you've ever seen a plant in extreme heat, they wilt because plants need that water to keep their cells rigid and to keep themselves upright. They don't have bones, right? Plants have water in their cells instead of bones. And so as they utilize that water to keep themselves cool, they start to wilt and they stress. And if that happens too often, as if you're like me, I just planted a plant this spring and I forgot to water it enough. And now I'm not 100% sure it's gonna survive, right? So you can imagine what happens to these, all of our native plants as they sweat in the sun. And then at night when they're trying to recover, suddenly they're dealing with 80 degree nights. How do you recover when your nights are as hot as your days used to be, right? So it's, it's so warm at night that they don't even have a recovery period. And then during the day, they're sweating out all of their water and they're, uh, they're struggling. So cold water is a much more effective carrier of dissolved oxygen, which is what anything that breathes water actually needs to survive. Anything that breathes water still breathes oxygen, it just breathes it through the water. And cold water carries a lot of dissolved oxygen, which is why you find some of our higher quality fish in cold water. Uh, if you look at 
large fish like tuna out in the ocean. They don't live in the tropics. They live in deep cold water where there's a lot of nutrients. Um, and warmer water, especially some of our shallower bodies of water, uh, can't support large populations of fish. Uh, when we have warm surface runoff that's uh, going into our bodies of water, especially if we have frequent warm rains, uh, we are depleting the oxygen level and creating these hypoxic zones within our water bodies that are uh, decimating our fish populations and other aquatic organisms as well. We also have to think about cyanobacteria. This is not anything new to people in Indiana. If you uh, go to the beaches here in Indiana, go to lakes here in Indiana, you have probably seen IDEMS reports where they say which beaches are and are not safe to go to at certain times of year because of blue-green algae. Um, warmer water tends to be stagnant. Cold water is able to shift and mix, and that keeps things fresh and flowing. Uh, even in lakes that seem like they don't move, they, are, they have temperature differentiations like our atmosphere from top to bottom. But as temperatures get warmer and they don't cool off, they heat all the way through and they become stagnant bodies of water. And that gives rise to things like uh, cyanobacteria, which as you can see, obviously can kill fish. Um, people, every year there's a story of people who lose their dogs because they go to a lake and the dog drinks water with uh, cyanobacteria in it. Uh, it can cause rashes on humans, and if you're, you know, if you're small enough for children, uh, consuming it can even be uh, dangerous or, or potentially fatal. Uh, it is a neurotoxin; it releases a, a neurotoxin when it's uh, destroyed. So it's a, it's a very dangerous. It's not just ugly; it's very dangerous. And this is a great picture of um, a uh, uh, a professor from Purdue who went out on the Wabash during a a, a pretty historic drought, and he is standing on what should be the riverbed and what's in front of him are mussels which have been stranded because the water levels receded so far in the drought and the heat that these mussels were just sort of left um, out in the sun and that's unfortunate because they are a filtration system for all of our bodies of water so not only are these rivers getting smaller and getting less uh, getting warmer and supporting less life we're losing wildlife like mussels which uh, give us better water quality. So our water quality is also suffering from this. You also have to talk about what winters mean. Now it's kind of hard sometimes to convince people that milder winters is a bad thing. But um, if you know about plants and germination uh, rates and things like that, you can probably already understand why we need these days below freezing. Native seeds require a certain number of days below freezing in order for them to properly germinate, in order for them to have a high germination rate. Uh, losing those frosts and those freezes can mean our plants aren't uh, as successful at reproducing. There's also relationships. There's, there's countless relationships like the one between this, um, this bee and this flower. This is a spring beauty uh, flower and a spring beauty bee, and they are dependent upon one another. They've evolved together in the same environment. They require one another to survive. This is the primary pollinator of this flower, and this bee requires this flower in order to provide for its nest. As we get warmer temperatures, we get the appearance of earlier springs. So we get warmer temperatures sooner, which plants interpret as an early spring. You have probably experienced this at some point. I know this year we had a real warm snap uh, early on and all of my irises decided to pop up. And then we had a hard freeze and half of my irises died. So you can imagine what happens when you have a flower that is an ephemeral that blooms for a very short period of time, pops up, mistaking spring is here, and then is not it's active before the bee is ready and the plant closes up when the bee is still trying to feed its its nest um, their life cycles begin to diverge and that dependence on on one another um, starts to fracture and both species suffer and there are countless examples like this this is just one that uh, i like to use because this bee has uh, little pink pollen pants on and i think it's it's adorable there are also some mammals that are called winter dimorphs so their coat changes based upon what time of year it is. Uh, and when the cold temperatures set in, um, animals like this weasel may develop a white coat, which should help them hunt uh, in the winter. But if those cold temperatures don't come soon enough, they don't develop that white coat. And when winter does arrive, they're still brown and they aren't as successful at hunting because they don't blend into their environment and they will struggle to survive. Um, this may or may not be good news depending on whether or not you like uh, armored possums, but there are an increasing number of sightings 
of armadillos in Indiana, among other uh, southern species, but this one is uh, a pretty charismatic one. Uh, there have been about 15 sightings of armadillos in the last decade. They've been kept away largely because we have bodies of water between us and their habitat, but as we start to get those more Texas-like summers, those animals that are used to that kind of weather are starting to make their way up here and starting to find a home in Indiana. And it may be innocuous with something like an armadillo. I don't really know what the effects of an armadillo population in Indiana would be, but you can imagine something like the kudzu problem that they have uh, down south uh, making its way up into Indiana. That's something we really don't want to have to fight on the scale that we're currently fighting things like honeysuckle. So we talked about this earlier too. Snow will more frequently, more frequently fall as rain. We have a lot of animals that can scavenge in the snow. They can dig through the snow to find the grass underneath, but when all we have is rain um, and we have flooding, they can't necessarily do that. These floods can cause an impediment to their migration patterns, to their breeding um, behaviors. And uh, we really wanna see, I know it's hard to, to say, but we really wanna see snow, not rain um, in Indiana in the winter. Nobody likes invasives, nobody likes uh, invasive parasitic organisms, but it is pretty much a guarantee that warmer weather will always favor the parasite over the host. And so when we start to have hotter summers and warmer winters, we are almost always creating conditions where a parasitic organism is now gaining leverage over its host. And that can disrupt a natural cycle in our native animals um, where they are controlled by the weather. But if we have invasive parasitic organisms, we're just increasing their ability to uh, destroy our native habitats. And I do apologize hey, for having, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, quick question on that last slide. What are we looking at there? I believe that's an emerald ash borer. You know, I thought that was good. I thought maybe, but it was like, no, that's too obvious. That's like <laughs> Wizard of Oz emerald. <laughs> Yeah, okay. they're very beautiful. They're very beautiful. I uh, I don't hate them. I just hate that they're invasive. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Sorry to interrupt. No, no problem. Uh, I I also apologize for having a, a giant picture of <laughs> a mosquito and a tick. I know this is probably unnerving for a lot of people, but <laughs> uh, it is very important to mention that when we have longer, hotter summers, we are increasing the breeding uh, time and the breeding habit, the breeding range of these pest species. I use pest in quotation marks, they're not actually on the slide, but uh, when we have longer, hotter summers, we have more cycles that these mosquitoes and ticks can breed through. Uh, they don't have a hard cutoff. They'll keep going until the weather stops them. And we are increasing their range because hotter temperatures mean they can move, doesn't really matter here in Indiana, but they can move up altitudes and they can also move up latitudes as, uh, as the temperatures uh, start to warm. So we are, we are exacerbating uh, our um, tick and mosquito um, problems, and we know what kind of diseases they carry. Uh, that is not something that we uh, want to be helping with. I'm going to skip this slide, move on. I couldn't talk about climate change in Indiana without talking about ag, because we are an agricultural state. Um, it is a very, very important uh, aspect of Indiana, and all of our farmers know they have already experienced what climate change can do and what it's going to do as we continue to move forward if we don't do anything. So we spend about a billion dollars a year on agricultural pest control. And like I said, these warmer temperatures are going to exacerbate pest problems. It's not just uh, pests on the human body, but it's also pests on our crops. Uh, the stink bugs, for instance, this is a weevil here. Um, their populations are going to continue to increase. More money is going to be spent on pest control, which means more chemicals being put down, sometimes irresponsibly, um, and causing drift. It means more exacerbated problems from, from the drift of pest control, uh, pest chemicals. So not only is it a huge expense for our farmers, it's also going to be a potential ecologic expense for uh, everyone else. This picture is what I call, this is, I think this is climate change in Indiana. This is, this is our version of the polar bear clinging to the iceberg or the uh, bleaching coral reef, right? This is flooded crops. This is what uh, 
we're anticipating in Indiana moving forward. So in 2011, and if you guys remember back, I know it seems like a million years ago at this rate, but if you remember back to 2011, uh, we had 11 of the 14 weather-related disasters uh, occur in the Midwest. It, they occurred here. 11 of the 14 weather-related disasters that hit the United States occurred in the Midwest, and they cost over a billion dollars in Indiana to mitigate. Uh, in 2008, if you remember, we had a historic uh, flooding event. Uh, 24 people were killed. This hit southern Indiana uh, very hard. There was about $8 billion in agricultural losses. And we can really only expect things like this to continue and probably to increase in severity. And then this happened just uh, last year. This is July 2019. Uh, Eric Holcomb designated 88 of our 92 counties, almost the entire state as a uh, disaster designation because of flooding. Uh, if you look back on the planting numbers from 2019, we planted a fraction of the crops we normally would have. Uh, it was devastating to our agricultural industry. And this picture just kind of sums all that up where it's not something we're used to seeing in Indiana with gazebos, uh, being completely covered with water up to the tops of street lights, but this this is the reality. This is what we're currently facing. Uh, Indiana's climate crisis is going to look like a lot of flooding. Now we are working to mitigate this. We have a two billion dollar twenty year program to reduce um, some of the uh, effects of this increased rainfall. So I don't know how familiar you are with our sewage system in Indiana, but we have what's called a CSO, a combined sewer, sewer overflow, which basically just means that our raw sewage uh, runs parallel through the same tubes as our rainfall from our storm drains. And what happens is when we get a, a rain event over a certain amount, uh, those two water sources combine and they overflow. And where they are deposited in Indianapolis is the White River. So about 60 times a year, we have a rain event significant enough to cause discharges into the White River, and that's raw sewage. It's about 8 billion gallons of untreated, untreated sewage into the White River every year. And when I say raw sewage, it's exactly what you're thinking it is. So that's kind of contributed to this notion that uh, the White River is this dirty, uh, filthy place. Uh, you shouldn't go there. About 60 times a year, you probably don't want to be in that water. Um, 280 million of that $2 billion has been put into something called the Deep Rock Tunnel, which is basically a big storage tunnel that will fill up with water uh, from these CSOs during these rain events and can be treated uh, over a longer period of time. We're trying to, to use an appropriate analogy, I guess, we're trying to flatten the curve on that 60 combined sewage overflows a year uh, by depositing it into this uh, deep storage tunnel and treating it as, it, as we can. Uh, constantly rather than just after these rain events. Um, our prediction though is that while they say it's going to reduce our overflows to four a year instead of 60 a year, by the time it's actually completed it will probably be uh, less impactful than that. It will probably be too small of an effort. Uh, it is still a great thing to do and we still really really need it and it's a big step forward in keeping the White River a little bit cleaner. But um, we have to have even bigger measures than this, which is a little bit startling. So, hey, Aaron, I, yeah, I keep interrupting you, but you said you were open to questions, so I'm taking you up on that. Please I just do. wanted to make the note there to drive home when we're looking at that tunnel that is going to be insufficient for our um, for the overflows that um, people in the area have actually the power to help mitigate that by constructing green stormwater infrastructures on their properties and to advocate for um, green stormwater infrastructure on public properties as well. I um, recently moved, returned to the Midwest from another state city that had the same problem and they spent um, a lot of city funding on creating rain gardens and cistern systems um, in those parts of the watershed that contributed so much to the overflow, so certain areas were worse at overflowing. So um, I just wanted to take a moment to make that point real quickly. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, there are a lot of ways. I'm going to talk about things that we can we can all kind of do here in a, in a minute. But yeah, there are a lot of ways that we can contribute to this uh, solution. 
um, I'm glad to see Indiana moving forward with something this big. This is it's very impressive, but it's also nice to see people taking local action as well. Um, so we were at a, a conference with National Wildlife Federation, and it was all about climate change and we were trying to find ways to express the severity and the urgency of this without sounding like we are being, without being panicked. And one of the speakers actually made an analogy that I kind of like, so I'm going to steal it from him. Uh, he, he said, imagine that you're on an airplane and you're flying through the sky. If you look out the window, you can see that that plane is held together by thousands of tiny little rivets. Uh, if you look all through the cabin, you'll see those little rivets all, all over the plane. And he said, now imagine someone is going through the cabin and they're punching those rivets out of the plane one at a time. And they knock one out and that's a species that's got, that's the Bramble K. Malomus that just went extinct because of climate change. And they knock another one out and they say, that's the rusty past bumblebee that we just lost to climate change. And they knock another one out and that's uh, an ecosystem that's been lost, uh, become too unstable to, to be self-sustaining anymore. And they're knocking these out one at a time and each one represents something that we are losing uh, some habitat or some wildlife that we're losing. And you have to ask yourself, how many times are you okay with that happening before you stand up and say something, before you, before you do something? Uh, it's not something we can keep passing off to, to future generations um, because we're all on this plane right now uh, together. This is currently happening. And he said, now imagine that you're on that plane and you're flying into a storm called climate change. This is not a storm that our plane was ever designed to survive. This is not something we ever tested this plane for. And so not only are we going into this, um, something that we're not prepared for because of habitat loss, because of the neglect and, and destruction of our environment, we're going into it with a, a really shaky plane that is not prepared for this. Um, so when we look at some of the global temperature data, it kind of drives this point home. Um, July 2019, obviously I don't have the data for this year, but I can make a prediction on it. Uh, July 2019 was the hottest month in the 140 year NOAA global temperature data set record. So going back to 1880, when NOAA started keeping track of average temperatures, we've never had a warmer month in 2019. Uh, it was about 1.71 Fahrenheit above the 20, 20th century average. Um, Nine of the last 10 warmest Julys have occurred since 2005, and the last five Julys have beaten each other as the warmest months on record. So these last couple of decades, we have been breaking our own records over and over again. Um, we have had 415 consecutive months with the temperatures above the average 20th century average. So 415 months have been hotter than ever than that month has ever been recorded before. Um, 2019 July was the 43rd consecutive July with temperatures above normal. So for 43 years, July has been above normal. It hasn't dipped back down as we would hope to see in sort of a normal uh, cycle. Now, I don't obviously want to end on doom and gloom. So we have to talk a little bit about things that we can do uh, to mitigate these effects. And there are a few. Uh, we talked about planting for resiliency. Uh, Purdue has that list of resilient trees and things like that. Planting trees is a great way to, uh, to, to, to impact the global CO2 levels. Uh, they are carbon sinks. They take in carbon. They sequester it. They hold on to it. Uh, they control its slow release back into the environment. Um, Controlling invasives and planting trees are a great way to address erosion concerns. We have a lot, here in Indiana, we have a lot of soil loss. Our number one pollutant in our rivers is sediment because we have so many invasives along our riverbanks that are not holding soil in place. We have so much agricultural land that uh, is not uh, holding soil in place. And so planting native habitats, getting rid of invasives, this is a great way to help with that. And then I think contacting your legislators is far the most important thing that you can do. So we've been sort of told, uh, at least for my lifetime, that if we want to fight climate change, we need to change our light bulbs to something more efficient. We need to drive less. Uh, we need to turn our thermostats down. And all that stuff is well and good. 
but it puts the onus of climate change onto the shoulders of average people. And that's not where it belongs. That's where we've been told it belongs, but nothing that we do as individuals at our house is going to have the same kind of effect as what happens when we regulate the airplane industry, uh, the air travel industry, or the cruise industry. They pollute orders of magnitude more than, than you and I do even combined. And so contacting our legislators, you know, we're lucky enough, we live in a representative democracy where our representatives are supposed to, uh, they're supposed to represent our values and our opinions. And so we're able to reach out to them and say, this is what I care about. I need you to do something about it. I, I demand that you do something about it. So contact them often, contact them uh, regularly. IWF has a newsletter where when the important legislation comes out, we will uh, give you actionable items. So we will tell you, these are, this is who you need to contact. This is what you should support and not support. This is what's good for the environment and the wildlife. This is what's bad for the environment and the wildlife. Uh, we send out thank yous to people who do the right thing. Um, and there was a great quote by Bruce Stein also at the uh, NWF conference where he said, the scale of our response must match the scale of our problem. And so while I love the idea of taking actions here at home, and I do so myself, we also have to be aware that we need to take top-down actions. We need to have major dramatic changes at the very uh, highest levels of our government. And right now, I'm sure most of you are aware, we are not just backpedaling. We are, we are, we are sprinting in the wrong direction. And we are um, abandoning environmental regulations. We are shrinking the size of uh, some of our outdoor spaces. And we need to have a stronger unified voice. More of us need to come together and have a unified voice in fighting this because I can guarantee you that all of the big corporations who can benefit from reduced uh, regulations, they are on Capitol Hill. I've been to Capitol Hill. They're there, they're there in force and they have a lot of voice. They have the ear of every single politician there. They are uh, at our state house testifying on behalf of redu reduced uh, on, on laws that are going to reduce regulations. And so we have to be there as well, countering them. And we can't do that unless we have uh, a big movement behind us. And so I would encourage you to, while all the other things are great, you also have to be uh, politically active. I know it's not always the most comfortable thing. Uh, that's one of the reasons IWF uh, promotes ourselves as a political advocacy group is because we don't take sides, we're a nonprofit. We take sides on the environment, right? We, we support legislation, not legislators. And so if you aren't comfortable being involved in things like advocacy and politics, be involved in an organization that is, and they can speak on your behalf. And your membership means that they are taking more voices uh, to your legislators when they're trying to fight for positive change. So if you have any questions, that is all I have. I came in at 47 minutes, which I'm very proud of. That's right on time for me. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. I think I'm going to end my screen share at this time. Oh, Aaron, thank you. That is such a great presentation. I, um, the ability to take such a huge, enormous topic and really boil it down and apply it, not only locally, but in tangible terms that um, we as native plants and, and wildlife advocates can really understand personal impacts through the realms that we really believe in and want to protect. Um, thank you. That's really well done. Thank you. I hope everybody got something out of it. Uh, I'm here for questions. Um, I can also send out my email if anybody uh, wants to talk about any of this at some other time or if you want to schedule your own presentation at a later date, whatever. I have a quick question. You mentioned the newsletter, which made me think that I might not have um, I might not have a membership anymore. I might have let it expire. How can I check on that? Well, you can sign up for just our newsletter. Uh, everything's on our website, indianawildlife.org. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have a button. You can sign up just for our newsletter, uh, or you can uh, donate and become a member, which will also get you on the mailing list, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so whichever one you, you prefer, if you just want to check out the newsletter for a little while and see what's going on with IWF, we try to keep everybody up to date. Uh, it's not a whole lot to put in it during COVID times, but we're working on it. Yeah. yeah. Aaron, I have a, I have a question. Um, yeah. On uh, the climate change, we hear a lot about what we can do on the uh, national level or what we're not doing on the national level. Uh, but then a lot of, uh, since the federal government withdrew from a lot, doing a lot of things, a lot of local governments 
uh, are doing things uh, uh, to try to fill in some of that gap. What are some specific things on the state level that the state of Indiana could do to help fight climate change? Well, the, the one thing that sort of comes to mind for me right now is uh, <clears throat> anybody's familiar with Inca and the work that they do, they're supporting the Indiana Outdoor Stewardship Act. The biggest hurdle that I think Indiana faces when it comes to fighting any kind of uh, climate issue or environmental issue is we don't have the money. We don't have the money to pay for anything. And something like IOSA, the Indiana Outdoor Stewardship Act, would help fund, not only would it help draw funds here specifically in Indiana, but it would help draw a large match from the federal government that would blow up our funding for conservation. And that money is also, it also can go towards uh, mitigating climate change and fighting invasive problems, a lot of different um, things. Aaron, just to clarify, you just mentioned two different things, Inca and IOSA. Could you Sorry. just real quick? Yeah, Inca is the Indiana Conservation Alliance. It's a group of, uh, uh, it's a sort of a, a super group of conservationists, conservation, conservation groups who are, uh, it's a big think tank and they do a lot of uh, efforts to really support conservation here in Indiana in a lot of ways. But right now, sort of, at least in my opinion, the overwhelming uh, factor is IOSA is trying to just get money into Indiana. We we can't even come up with a plan right now because nothing can be funded. We can't even fund our DNR at its basement level funding right now. Um, so we really need to secure money for Indiana. And once that's done, we can start. We can start. You know, the sky's the limit, right? But we have to have that uh, cash flow first. And IOSA, the Indiana Outdoor Stewardship Act, um, is an effort to redirect, not create a new tax but redirect uh, current taxes on outdoor uh, equipment, whether it's fishing rods or hiking boots, uh, to a dedicated fund that would pay for conservation issues like restoring our uh, state parks and, and things like that. Uh, but it would also allow us to receive a match because right now we have so little money going towards conservation in Indiana, we don't qualify for a federal match of a bill called, I know it's another acronym, RAWA, um, we don't qualify for the match for that money. And so if we can pull together funding here in the United States, or here in Indiana, we can actually qualify for a federal match and pull down even more money, a significant amount more money. Um, that would, it would be a game changer for conservation here in Indiana. And if we don't take it, we're effectively leaving money on the table for conservation. It does not make any sense no. why we wouldn't try to qualify for this money. Aaron, I like that uh, response, uh, and so let me uh, take that opportunity to uh, mention two things uh, uh, as far as the stats. You mentioned the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. That's currently a part of a bill being considered in the House of uh, Rep. <coughs> Representatives, U.S. House, and the uh, Great, Ameri what is it? Great American Outdoors Act or Great Outdoor America. What is it? Which is it? Great Great Americans Outdoor Act? Probably. <laughs> you know, Aaron? I don't know specifically. Uh, Emily, no. you know, don't you? Emily wouldn't know. The Great American Outdoors Act. That's yes. it. Okay. That was part of the bill passed by the Senate recently uh, that'll be considered in the House. So if anyone w w wants, wants to help, and I'm sure you, you do, contact your U.S. representative and ask them to support the uh, Recovering Americans Wildlife Act and the Great American Outdoors Act. Did I say it right, Emily? Yep. Uh, Got it. Okay. Um, in in the, the Congress. And they, they'll, they'll know where it is in the process because it changes daily. Uh, well, not daily, but weekly anyway, where those things stand. But contact your congressman and tell them to support those two pieces of uh, legislation. And Aaron, is IWF's newsletter a good place to stay abreast of these legislative issues? Yeah, we try to keep everybody updated. Uh, we're a quarterly newsletter, so we come out once, uh, well, once a quarter. Um, so we try, we try to keep updates. We usually have once or twice a year, we'll have a legislative update. Um, but if anything is immediate and pending, we definitely put it in the newsletter. And we also, we try to do it infrequently. We don't like to email people uh, frequently, but if something is happening that we feel is urgent, we will send out an email blast and a call to action. So if we have a uh, something that needs a letter writing campaign or something like that. We'll send out a special email to anybody on the email list as well. Great. Are there any more questions right now?
Erin, thank you again so much for taking the time. It's such a fabulous presentation. So much good information that's easily delivered. And um, I think that's what we need on this subject matter. Um, we need to break it down and make it workable and, and relatable and that sort of thing. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah.